All right, we are here in episode 20 of the Trilogy Lacrosse Theater. We are bringing our first non-lacrosse athletic star on, and we couldn't be more excited to have Paul Burmeister on with us. Paul, welcome to the Trilogy Lacrosse Theater. Mitch, thanks for having me. RB, always, always good to see you and spend time with you this way. I got to say, I spent some time, you could call it research, or you could call it a way to uh, enhance your leisure time, but I was cleaning the house today, and I just listened to your podcast the entire time, and I thought, like, this is a bit of a right-hand turn for these guys. I, my only, the only lacrosse I have in my background is working on the PLL on the sidelines, so th this is kind of testing your range to see if you two dudes can pull this off. <laughs> well, you also yeah. have a child playing lacrosse now, and that's that is like as a lacrosse parent, that might be the more close tie to, mm. to trilogy right now. Yes, and that's uh, that was my first go around with it, and uh, continue uh, to be around that a lot as a lacrosse dad. I try not to fit the lacrosse dad stereotypes on the on the sideline too much, <laughs> but the combo of uh, going to the tournaments uh, in the summer and fall, and then uh, hanging out on the sideline with the PNL. PLL with Ryan, that's, uh, that's the extent of what I've got for you from lacrosse. Hold, hold on real quick. Let's, let's just get like one like trope or cliche. Like what was like your first moment as a lacrosse dad? You're, you're on the sideline, you're watching Ben, something happens and, and you like look left and you look right and you're like, oh, no one's reacting to this besides me? Like, wait, this is – this is my this is my new normal. Like, what was the first thing that you're like? Oh, okay. I've got to I've got to reset myself, not the other way around. Yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, my first lacrosse experience out here. I mean, Ben played a little bit in LA when he was little, and I didn't know anything about it. But once I came out here and it got a little bit serious, the first real tournament I went to was on Long Island. And oh. <laughs> as you guys know, I mean, that is, I mean, that is the World Series every time you go down there for some of those parents. So thankfully, their behavior was much worse than anything I thought mine might be. So they set the bar pretty low for any kind of immediate emotional reactions I might have. I, I was like, whoa, these guys are dead serious and they're a little bit scary, too. Well, I've always, I've always said I, I truly believe that for the most part, if you look over like a, a big data set, parents who have had the more success in sports are traditionally a lot more level-headed and understand just here's what it takes to get to the next level. I, like I know the difference between screaming at my kid and what it's going to take him to actually, you know, perform. Um, so I've always thought, and I'd be curious to hear your take, especially in football, if it's different, but do you feel the same way that you've seen, like, the more, the more success a parent has, and, and I bring that up because you had a very successful career in, in college football, and um, do you feel like that gives you a little bit more perspective that has, has allowed you to take a step back, or are you, are you still just, just going nuts? No, I think it's a good point, Mitch. It, it's one that, that I noticed right away, and as, as a dad, and I think you guys are awfully young in the dad stage to realize it, but even – for those of us who played and had a little bit of success, and you're right, it's usually the parents who didn't play who are really the ones responding in the improper way on the sideline. But you guys will see, I mean, that guy lives inside of all of us. <laughs> and the, the one thing they can bring it out after it's been dormant all these years is watching your kid play. And yeah. whether it's someone taking a cheap shot at your kid, or maybe you feel like your kid's not giving the effort he should. I mean, you feel, you feel that coming out. And you're kind of like, whoa, I, I thought I was like a relaxed, <laughs> mature, with the dad who was just here to give my kid a high five. And that's something that you know, I've, I've had to, to learn how to deal with. And thankfully, I haven't had any incidents. I'm talking about how I deal with myself as a dad here. I didn't know if you guys wanted to go there. Uh, but that dude lives inside of all of us. <laughs> and kids sports can bring it out if you're not careful. Yeah, any, any, like, any key, like, is it a 10 deep breaths? Or what is the, what is the technique that's been most successful when you feel the monster coming out? I, I find that the, the, the best cure for it is to, be, is to be standing next to my wife. <laughs> because she has zero tolerance. The, the, the zero tolerance policy for, for dads, especially her husband, who might get fired up on the sidelines. So that's, that's been a big help. See, I've projected myself – you know, and this is years and years and years. I've projected myself as the weirdo that is by himself in the corner. That's yeah. like, 
yeah, but maybe I maybe I should take this tack. Maybe I should stick close to the better half to to kind of. But I figure if I'm just sequestered or or yes. quarantined, dare I use the word quarantined? Um, <laughs> social distancing, yeah. <laughs> social distancing. Brian went social distancing for years. <laughs> yes. Before is cool. The ultimate hipster. <laughs> I think. I think the one thing you, sh you should consider here, RB, is that lacrosse, obviously, you're a Hall of Famer. It's your sport. So when it's your sport that you're watching your son or your daughter play, I think it's a completely different level. And I believe that being off on your own might be a good thing because there's a lot yeah. of comments. A lot of people yes. think they know what they're talking about. And I can kind of tolerate it on the lacrosse sideline because I don't really know either. So it doesn't bother me from an etiquette standpoint. But if I'm watching my son play football, and people are talking about the, the quarterback position, I might have to walk up to each one of them and tell them that you don't know a goddamn thing. Okay? <laughs> so, like, for your sport, I, I would keep that in mind, okay. buddy. Keep it in mind yeah. that being off on your own might be, might be the better way to go. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, I think that a, a good, smooth transition, you know, for anyone who, who doesn't know you, you know, you work for, with Ryan in the PLL, but, but for NBC across a wide range of sports doing play-by-play, -play, reporting, hosting. Um, but you, you, were a, you were a Midwestern boy at heart. You grew up in Iowa City, Iowa, right next door to Iowa University, where you ended up going to play sports. So I guess talk about growing up in Iowa and, and I mean, the, the difference between a tournament in Long Island and lacrosse and then mm -hmm. Iowa – just, just was, was like Iowa football, was that like the king and the goal from day one, like from when you could, were your parents involved with the university? Talk a little bit about your experience growing up there. Yeah, both of my parents were involved in the university. They, 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 both, they both worked at the university their entire lives. My dad was a, a professor and the associate dean at one of the colleges that made up the University of Iowa, the College of Public Health. And my mom was an administrator at different parts of the university kind of throughout my life. She was assistant director of the student union. She was the associate uh, uh, for one of the presidents at the university. So I was a university kid. I was a gym rat, grew up at all of the Iowa games, football, basketball, baseball. And I, I, I think you could understand a little bit, maybe as I see the uh, golden gopher on your t-shirt, maybe you know about oh, the, man. the gopher <laughs> sports. You, you probably got that when you're playing for the Minnesota Swarm. I, I, I my, my, my mother-in-law actually worked at, at University okay. of Minnesota, my, and my wife is from St. Paul. So that's my, my one tie. In there. Okay. Uh, Twin Cities are awesome. But growing up there, I mean, the University of Iowa Hawkeyes, think about how people out here feel about the Jets or the Giants or the Islanders, the Knicks. The Iowa Hawkeyes were that big to me and my friends. And maybe people out here are like, oh, it's just a Big Ten college town. I mean, me seeing the starting quarterback at the University of Iowa when I was 10 years old was just like somebody seeing Sam Darnold right now when they're 10 years old. It was, I mean, my eyes were, it was everything to me. So it was a really cool way to, gr to grow up to someone who loves sports and to have it that accessible, to be able to go to all the games and uh, get next to all the guys like that who were truly my heroes. It was an awesome way for a gym rat kid to, to grow up. Well, and even, I mean, even now, there's no Iowa pro sports team, major big pro sports team. So you have the college or the university. What, what other, like, what team, were you like a Kansas City Chiefs fan growing up? What pro sports were you a fan of? So it, it, it kind of came and went with, with whatever local team was doing well. So, like, in the mid-'80s when the Chicago Bears were, like, the Chicago Bears in 85, everybody liked the Bears. It was a three-hour drive away. Uh, but there was never one team that I was living and dying with their games. And I didn't know it at the time, but doing what I do now when I was at NFL Network for 10 years, it was really a blessing to not really care who won or lost these professional games. Uh, I see a lot of my colleagues just really I mean that they have a hard time getting through their day when their team doesn't play well, their team loses. And I never had that professionally um, as a kid, and I don't have it now just because, as you mentioned, no pro sports in Iowa. We just kind of enjoyed watching, whether it was Chiefs, Vikings, Packers, Bears, kind of, you know, watched being on the periphery of all those teams. Well, I got to imagine what is a little bit of good rivalry in between your friends, right? It's like somebody likes a bear, somebody else likes oh, yeah. a Chiefs. Yeah, exactly. What is, uh, uh, just going back to, to Mitch's shirt here, and I, mm -hmm. and I love the little, the little jab. I actually used to have an, an Iowa shirt because uh, our dear friend Matt Striebel uh, went to school, graduate school there, and, and his wedding was there. 
and I love the Hawkeye. What is your hierarchy in terms of what is what is top of the totem pole, and what is like? Oh God, that's just the absolute pits. Because I think the Gopher is pretty cool, especially the vintage ones. Pretty cool. So you cut out there. They get a key a, a, a key part there. I, I heard hierarchy. Rye, you're cut. We can't hear you. I think you might need to ditch the AirPods. Hierarchy. There we go. Ten mascots. Okay. Hierarchy of Big Ten mascots. Well, I think you've got to start, I mean, with the Hawkeyes. Exactly. Was in Iowa City, but it's super cool. Badgers and Wolverines. I mean, I mean, come on. I know that, like, there are other conferences that get more respect, especially in football, but, you know, the – Auburn Tigers, the Georgia Bulldogs, LSU Tigers. Those are pretty standard Boring. garden variety mascots. I mean, we've got Buckeyes, Boring. Hawkeyes, Gophers. We've got Boilermakers, Hoosiers. Even the, the guys who have come on board late, Nittany Lions. You've got the Terrapins. I mean, these are some pretty cool mascots. Yeah. I mean, Spartans, I guess, is, is a little bit cliche, but – Big Ten rules when it comes to mascots, guys. Yeah, my dad. Uh, my dad went to grad school at Purdue, so he's a big Boilermaker fan. And I, I think they have some of the, you know, their lacrosse team is a club lacrosse team, MCLA, and they have put out some gear that is of the freshest gear with the gold and the black and the white. They have some really nice stuff. Yeah, my grandpa was a was an All Big Ten lineman for Purdue in like 1936. Was and Purdue Pete a real person then? What's the head? Purdue Pete. Was he a real guy driving a real train back then? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if he existed back then. But <laughs> after Purdue, he actually he played for the Cleveland Rams in like 1937 for a year for like $125 a game. I found his old contract one time. And he didn't like it. They weren't making money. So he just came back to Iowa to be a farmer the rest of his life. And so your grandfather was a football player. Was your dad a football player as well? In high school. My dad was all state football, basketball, baseball, and played basketball at Iowa State in the uh, in the early '60s. So, um, and I I followed the same thing. I was football, basketball, baseball my entire life. Back when you know everybody who enjoyed sports played you know three or four sports way back if in the day. You, if you had played lacrosse, and now you you've watched enough, and your son plays, but like what what is the sport? What is the position that you would kind of project? yourself to either from like a natural skill set or from like an aspirational just like oh I just think that position is cool or that guy's got a certain style so I would want to kind of play that would have been an offensive midi yeah. for sure because yeah. <laughs> six three six four a little too big to play attack but I didn't I, I would have had no part with the two-way midi and having to run down and play defense and like wear myself out and like use energy I could have used to score a goal. That, that would not have been my game. And I, I project myself as a basketball player because in hoops I was a three guy. Okay. And just it was all about, you know, shooting threes, taking to the hoop. And, you know, I, I, I kind of rested on defense a little bit. I really <laughs> liked it when we played zone. I could drop back and kind of act like I was working, but I wasn't really. So those two-way middies I've got a lot of respect for. But I, I would not have been wasting energy on the defensive end. So, so growing up, I mean, it, I would imagine it's every kid's dream to then, you know, play high school football under the lights and then, and then sign, sign that you're going to play at Iowa or probably even Iowa State for some of the kids. So was, that, was that like something that happened often or was it, I mean, were you like the talk of the town, the story of, of your graduating class? I got to admit, you were all state in football as a quarterback. So was it like, oh, oh this, this guy is like Mr. Iowa here. Well, it was, it was a really fun time because, I mean, any, any of us who were, you know, decent athletes in high school, of course you enjoy the attention in your little town that, that comes along with it. I, I certainly wasn't the only one. There were plenty before and plenty after in Iowa City who ended up going on to play at Iowa. And I, I wanted to be a basketball player. That, that was my main thing up until about my junior year in high school. And I started realizing that maybe football might be a, be a better route. But I just wanted to be – I wanted to be – I wanted to play on TV. I wanted to play in front of 20,000 people at hoops or 100,000 people in football, like my entire life. And I don't say this like it's a good thing. Like I really hope my sons are more well-rounded. I wanted to play catch and shoot free throws. That's, 
that was my life. And then when I got to Iowa, I just wanted to go to practice and be better the next day. I was extremely limited in, in what I liked and, you know, what I liked about my own talents and skills. And it was 100% to do with, you know, playing hoops or playing ba uh, baseball or playing football as I got older. So um, I guess it was kind of a big deal to have somebody from Iowa City go there and play quarterback, but there are plenty of others who have done it too. And, and were there other schools in contention or as soon as, as, soon as you got attention from Iowa, were you like, I'm, I'm in? And I, it sounds like it was your childhood dream, so. Yeah, and that, that's a popular, and it's not like I talk about this with a lot of people, but uh, I think people assume that because I grew up there, I just wanted to go there. And I was actually on my way to go play football at Kansas State. And this is getting a little bit into the, the nerdy weeds of what was going on back then. But when Hayden Fry came to Iowa, he brought with him an offensive coordinator named Bill Snyder. And if you know college football, Bill's a Hall of Famer. He was the head coach at Kansas State until a couple of years ago and just did a phenomenal job there. But he was a quarterback coach and old coordinator at Iowa when I was growing up. And I got to know him from going to the camps. And back before, there were too many, like, NCAA kind of rules. I mean, Snides would call me when I was in high school and be like, hey, um, the guys are, are going to be working out at 7 o'clock tonight. You know, Chuck's expecting you. Why don't you go over there? So I was, like, practicing – during the summer, like throwing seven on seven like when I was 16, 17 years old. And then Snides went to Kansas State, and I almost went with him. But at the time, Sports Illustrated had just rated Kansas State to have the last rated football program in the country, and, <laughs> which, one, gives you an idea what an unbelievable job he did to take it from there to being an 8, 9, 10, 11 win team every single season. Uh, but it kind of represented that. Like when I got down there and I was used to the Iowa facilities and the Iowa players, it just felt like a program that was a real long way away. And I couldn't quite make myself do it when I had the hometown team there waiting to offer me too. That, that's, that, that gives me chills, the thought of like getting to go and play with, you know, the, the college team, on getting, a, getting the call up. That's, that's a, that's a so pretty much special, special experience there for, for any kid, but then for it to be like your heroes too. Yeah, awesome time. Really, really awesome time. And thankfully, I think I appreciated it when I was, when I was going through it too. I mean, as we get older, we never think we had as much appreciation as, as we should have at the time. But I, I really have awesome memories of that time, I mean, 17, 18 years old, realizing I was going to have a couple of opportunities I've been working for. And it, it's not hard to get in touch with that feeling and remember how rewarding and just how much fun that was. How, how tough of a conversation was that with Snides? Like, Coach Terrible. Snyder, excuse me, I don't – Yeah. Coach Snyder. Um, yeah. You know. Snyder, old Snidesy boy. It was awful. It was terrible. I cried. I cried through the whole thing, guys. Yeah. And so my official visit to Kansas State was the week before my official visit to Iowa. So oh. – Snides was at my house like the next night waiting for me after I got back from my official visit to Iowa. And he walked in, I remember he sat down and my mom offered him a glass of wine because he used to like to sip on wine. And he goes, no, 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 that's okay. And he, and he said, he goes, so Polly, can I wrap you up and just take you with me? And I just broke down. I just started crying. Oh, and it, was it was it that stark on your trip to Iowa that you're like, this is where I'm meant to be? And yeah, yeah, it was clear. And the the biggest thing, and I loved him, and that's what it made me sad to tell him that I wasn't going to come down and play for him and with him. Um, it wasn't him. It was the players in the Iowa program were kind of representative of, you think about kids 18 to 22 who are pretty good in school. They're used to winning nine or 10 games. I mean, it, it was a classy program. And I really liked the guys that I was around that weekend. I'm like, man, I want to be like these guys. I want them to respect me in a year or two. And I didn't get the same feeling when I was at K-State. So I knew that weekend that I was going to go to Iowa and told him and kind of cried my way through it and tried to explain it to him in a way I explained to you guys while I was 17 and while I was crying. So it was pretty rough. I remember after I got done, I went back downstairs to my room and, and I remember Snide saying to my mom, he's like, maybe I will have that glass of wine. <laughs> In fact, make it a whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, well yeah. would you have had a chance, would you have had a chance to, to start freshman year or, or earlier if you had gone to Kansas State, you think? I think I probably, I probably would have played a lot earlier because I would have had to. 
and yeah. because I was the head coach's project. Right. And even though Hayden Fry liked me and believed in me, I was one of I was one of twenty kids in that class. And so he didn't like me any better, any worse than any of the other ones. I think Coach Snyder probably would have looked after me in a way that he'd known me for seven or eight years and he came from my hometown. And I, I think he would have tried to groom me a little earlier than, than the Iowa coaches did. And that's no fault of the Iowa coaches. So I think I would have ended up playing, playing earlier and probably playing more. The ironic thing is when I was a free agent with the Vikings, the guy that was in my class that they drafted was the one who started at Kansas state and was, I don't know if it was big eight or big 12 then, but he was an all conference quarterback there for Snyder who was my age. Oh, wow. Yeah. Small, small world. All of these I know, are right? small when you get to when you get to the apex of it. It's wild. Yeah. And and so you so you get to Iowa and obviously had a couple of years to to learn and fit into the program. And then it was your junior year, right? You came in towards the back half. Was that was the was that a quarterback who got injured or or did they just say it's it's Paul's time to take over here? Yeah. So my my best friends were always the quarterbacks older than me. We spent so much time together and I looked up to them and I just wanted to be close with them. And I ended up being super tight with the quarterback one year ahead of me and the quarterback two years ahead of me. And so the quarterback two years ahead of me graduated. I was behind the quarterback who was one year ahead of me and tied with a guy who had transferred in from from Michigan State. We were tied like our entire career. And so my best friend, Jimmy Hartley, we went to Illinois, and he was a starting quarterback. He went to hand a ball off. The ball came out. He dove for it. The middle linebacker dove on, on his shoulder and, like, dislocated shoulder. So he's done. He's laying on the ground. And I'm all at once like, God, that's my best friend. He's out there. I mean, he was writhing in pain. My other thought was, are they going to put me in, or am I going to have to watch this other guy go in? Because we were literally back and forth the whole time. So I got one eye on Jimmy. One eye on the head coach to see if he's going to put me in. And he puts the other guy in. And Matt went in and played fine and then started the next week against Purdue and didn't do well. Started the next week against Ohio State, did really poorly in the first half on a national televised game. And he came in at halftime. Hayden Fry came in at halftime and said, Matt, if we don't go down and score on this first drive, I'm going to give Paul a chance to see what he can do. So it's this very weird situation. You guys have probably been in it too, where I'm on the sidelines, the first series of the third quarter, love my teammates, oh want my the Hawks God. to win, and I'm just like, throw it into the ground, dude. Go <laughs> pick, guy. Fumble the snap. You know, you know, it's so odd to be like – Yeah. You think of these, these like you said, the situations that are, you know, you're not going to get hurt, but it's like, yeah, just, just, just drop the snap. Just I didn't want him to get hurt. Cases. I, mean, like, I really liked the guy, too. Like, we were friends, but damn it, I wanted to play. Yeah. yeah. And so we didn't go down and score. They put me in. It was a driving rainstorm, I remember. But we, I, I came in, we scored a couple times, had some success, and then we, I started the rest of my career. And, and, and you know, get, diving into the video stuff that, that – is 93 we can find some stuff i gotta say yes. oh, there's there's yes. there's some good content online but but youtube was not kind to, to you guys in the in the 1993 season you were good you guys were six and five you went to the first first ever alamo bowl yeah uh, but the Boy, games what? that are available online you know are not uh are not great for paul burmeister and the hawkeyes no 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 yeah i i, I told ryan because I haven't looked for highlights for a long time, but I wanted to help and like have some good and some funny and some bad. Any of the good I had like is not on YouTube. Like it's all me getting sacked and throwing picks. And if, I was, if I was 29 instead of 49, I might, I might be a little more upset about it, but I'm, I'm happy to, to watch and laugh with, with, with we can, like, lose Paul over the next like five minutes. And he has like a bad Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll know. <laughs> we'll know why. yeah. Yeah. So what do you got there? What are we going to do? So the first one we've got here is Penn state at Iowa. So this was, uh, this was 93. Mm. So this is your senior season. Uh, yeah. They had a, I think they, they had a pretty good day this day. So before, before we roll too much here, Penn State won the national title the next year, and all those guys were playing. They were, they were pretty good. Okay. So we hit play. Tried to throw the post. Yeah, it's picked off. Shelly Hammonds. Oh, that, 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 the, Vikings. Receiver. That's, the receiver's got to go up and win that battle, right? Or just play <laughs> defensive back. I mean, this is double coverage, right? I mean, yeah, so, not to be armchair quarterback here, but double coverage. Let's take coverage. that back. 
What do you think, back, fellas? So, what cards were they in? Take it back here. Okay, so hit pause. So we had just come up with a turnover, and it was like the crowd was wow. way into it. Hayden was like, let's go get them right now. You quick turn around, let's go deep. And I didn't get my feet set, and then I threw – this corner got drafted by the Vikings. And if you watch where the ball ends up, it's, it should be more toward the middle of the field. Like if I were to put the ball in the middle of the field, that corner who was really good wouldn't have been able to go up and make that play because he has the safety beat. Harold Jasper has the safety beat, but I leave it back on the inside hash and I put it, should have put it in the middle of the field. Mitch, rewind real quick. Where do you throw this from? What's that? This is a freaking Probably... That was the 35-yard line. 35. Yeah. It was a, a 15. It was not a good – it was – like, I deserved to have that ball picked. That was not a good throw. Yeah, that was all my fault. All right, what do we got here? Uh-oh, look out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <the> fella. <laughs> so, take that back. Take that back, guys. You know what made me really mad here? So – this lineman, getting, this lineman getting just totally dusted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no. So bad. Just so, watch this play one more time in the hip pause. Okay, so play it through. Play it through. Ouch. Do you call that a fumble or an interception? That's a fumble. It's backwards. That's what I thought, too. I was in the post-game press conference, and the, one of the reporters goes, uh, you, you threw three interceptions. I was right away. I'm like, I threw two. He's like, no. <laughs> You threw three. I'm like, no, I didn't. I threw two. And they counted this as a pick. And like, no. Seven years later, I'm still pissed off. That's a fumble. No, it's a fumble. You're, you, you haven't even gone forward yet. You're here. You get hit. It goes backwards. And yeah. if Tom Brady was a little bit, a little bit older, maybe that would be an incomplete pass. Well, there you go. There you go. Rewind this, Mitch. What are you saying to this left tackle after the play? Like, like, like hey, buddy, like, like can you get – at least a hand on him? <laughs> <laughs> Was there a uh, something or he just came right around? He just no, right I'm trying not to. Right by him. Right by him. <laughs> not even a whip. <laughs> tried to stay nice to those guys. Um, okay, so hit pause. Hit pause. There are two first-round picks for Penn State right now. Do you guys know who they are in that picture? Was this 1993? 1993. Actually, there are three, I believe. The quarterback is Kerry Collins. Running back is Carter. Yannick Carter. Yep. I, yes. And the, ta- the uh, tight end is Kyle Brady. Yes. Wow. Yeah, they were. And they, they all came back the following year when they, won the, when they won the national championship. Say that again. They all came back the following year when they won the national championship. Yeah, I think this was a nine and two or ten and one team, and then they came back and won every game the next year. They tied that year, right? Oh, yes. Look at this. Yeah. He's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I don't know. You tell me what I'm doing." <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's Kajana Carter. Yeah, you want to tackle him, guys? Somebody tackle him. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Pa. Yeah. Wow. I that was their first. That was their first Big Ten game. Their oh, very first Big Ten game was on the road in Iowa City. So you guys, as you, as you can see, that the next touchdown we score will be the first. <laughs> <laughs> so you won. You won the first two games, and then you guys went on a bit of a skid, right? Yeah. And you guys, and then you came back and won. I think this was the, one of the the games towards the end of that skid against Michigan. Um, mm, it yeah. looked like it was a little bit, a little bit closer. Yeah, uh, we, we hung around this game for a little while. Uh, it was like a Maybe game practice. for quite Maybe a bit, and then, then they scored a late touchdown. Um, the funny thing is, like, in the studio, like, Mike Tirico's in the studio, now <laughs> calling at NBC, and Chris Fowler's throwing to me, and Brad Nessler's on the call. It's fun stuff. Yeah, I saw Tirico, and I had to do it. I was like, I think that's Mike Tirico from, you know, whatever, it's almost 30 years. He was probably like 25. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the main anchor there. There we go. The big house. What a thrill, guys. I remember, what? and maybe it's a sign of I didn't have a great playing career, but there's at that stadium, you come out of the visitor's locker room, you've got like a 50-yard walk down this very narrow tunnel, and you can see the light at the end that is, you know, it's, it's the big house. And I remember walking down with the captains and thinking, man, this is, this is so cool. I'm going to go start at Michigan. And that walk is something I'll always remember. Yeah, I, I mean, like, 
what what how do you even get your head wrapped around playing in front of that many people like it's it's a clean hundred thousand like it's yeah. like yeah i can't even like what is that like like it's just it was so much fun and there there were parts of playing that were pressure packed and like you, you guys were were big time athletes too part of it Part of the whole deal in those four or five years isn't always fun, but on Saturday, walking out there in front of 70,000 or 100,000, to me, that just added to the fun. I knew they were all watching the quarterback, and I really, I really got off on that and enjoyed it. And yeah. th there were parts of it that didn't feel good, but, man, those huge crowds were just nothing but fun. Like, I don't think people, like nor normal people, for lack of better words, like understand – what it's like to be in a stadium and yell something out and, and it actually not be heard. It's like so <laughs> loud that you're talking and not, yeah. only, and, and I've only had this a couple times happen. So I can't even imagine what it's like in this type of crowd where yeah. not only can no one else hear you, but when you are yelling it, you actually, it doesn't even circle back to your own ears. You're like, I can't even hear myself. Right. Right. And I think what, what – and there's another first-round pick, City of New York. Ty Wheatley was a first-round running back for the Giants. But one thing that surprises people about the Big Ten stadiums, I could name you five or six stadiums louder, more aggressive, more hostile than the Big House. Easily, just off the top of my head. Like Michigan is middle of the pack. What's the most hostile? Ohio State, Wisconsin. Um, I, I did not play at Penn State, but everybody swears Penn State is the same. What is that a tribute to? Is that, is that a tribute to a little V Michigan highbrow, uh, we're going to behave ourselves kind of like? Uh, yeah, but... and that, I, I now work with so many Michigan grads. I mean, it, I didn't know how popular Michigan was on the East Coast, but they're so used to success, and there's, a, there's an aura and culture around Michigan where it's more like a, a golf clap after they score instead of going crazy. There's a, there's a Burmeister touchdown right there. Yeah. There we go. Tie game at that point. Let's get another look at it. And what's so, the Iowa reputation for, for the, uh, the stadium that you guys played in? I so think, I think after, after Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Penn State, I think Iowa is easily the fourth toughest place to play. Like you ask Kirk Curb Street or guys who go around and make it their living to know what these environments are like. Iowa is no joke, man. The, the, the stands are right on top of you. 75,000 people there. It's a, it's a tough place to play. Mitch, can we go back to that touchdown one more time? Of course. Uh, first of all, this is, I, I, I feel like Iowa, whether it's a fullback or a tight end or an H-back, they always have that brick wall white guy that has no neck, and then like, <laughs> it goes right out to shoulders, and then, and then this guy takes his helmet off, and, it, and of course – he has to have just the flat top. It's like he's like a like an '80s villain. Like, like is this half the team or is this like? Here it is. Let's pause right here. Like that haircut. I just feel like there's always an Iowa tight end, H back, or fullback. Like, like you just have to have that. It, like on every Iowa team. That's yeah. like corn fed Midwest, right? That's the definition of corn fed Midwesterner. That's a very good point. And that's Kent Call. He's actually from Colorado. And he was the, the really? state high school player of the year in Colorado and went to CU for a couple of years and wasn't playing and then transferred to Iowa and uh, turned out to be a really good player. Yeah, the uh, run game struggled that day, fellas. We, weren't <laughs> getting much. we were not getting much done there. Look at Hayden. Yep. <laughs> not, not, not thrilled. Not thrilled right now. No. All right. What was Aiden like as a coach? He was awesome. He was um, – he's a Hall of Famer, too. I uh, just passed away this, this past winter. And I think what made Hayden really good is he was able to walk this fine line as a coach where everybody was afraid of him, but everybody really, really liked him and enjoyed him, too. And I don't know how he exactly did it, but – if your head coach maintains this kind of larger than life thing where you, you really are a little bit afraid of him, but yet you appreciated the sense of humor and, and thought he was fun too, he, he had the perfect balance.
There we go. Another sack, fellas. You, you, like definitely, you definitely call him Coach Fry, though, right? Not Hayden. Maybe later in life you, you switched over to the, to the Hayden? Or was that... <laughs> I, I never called him Hayden in real life. Okay. No. <laughs> just, just checking, because, yeah, I, I – uh... Oh, there's the worst pick I ever threw, fellas. That's it? Yeah, that's the one. I thought I was going to get benched there for good after that interception. Why was this the worst? It's coming off, as, as Mitch pointed out, it was coming off a couple, three games that were really poor for the, for the entire team. And this game was starting to get away from us, and I threw it right to a strong safety. And I just – I remember coming over the sidelines and thinking, if, if Coach has any, any kind of doubt or disbelief in me, like, th this is it. Like, I could be putting on the baseball cap for the rest of my season right here. Did you and just not see the safety there? Just didn't see him. Yeah. Just didn't see him and, you know, threw it right to him. And thankfully he put me back in and things really got better from that point on. But that was a – that might have been the low point. And I had a couple moments of thinking that was the, the last pass I would throw as a starting quarterback. Well, you, you didn't. You, they, he had that faith in you and brought you, you brought the boys to the Alamo Bowl. And yeah. what was – I mean – what was the what is the feeling around a bowl game? Because I I didn't play football, but it's a unique thing that's unlike anything in other college sports with the bowl series, right? What was that? Was it was it excitement? Was it like, hey, we're in a bowl? Did you care? Was it just like it's another big game? I guess the TV aspect. Yeah, it was totally. It was it was awesome, and for all the reasons that that you know you kind of brought up, it was a bowl game. And back in '93, it was kind of transitioning. It was starting to go to this place where if you were an average team, you got to go to a bowl game. But back then, you, you had to have a winning record. You had to be a decent team to, to get to a bowl game. So there was a real excitement that went along with it. And we struggled most of the season. So I think we won our last four games and we're just starting to play well. And to get rewarded with the bowl game was, I thought, just awesome. And the problem is we played Cal. And Cal was about one quarter or one series away from going to the Rose Bowl. There's Tariko, Corso, and James. That's awesome. But Cal was really close to going to the Rose Bowl. And because they don't travel well, they got sent to the Alamo Bowl. So they were a 9-2 and two team. We were a true 6-5 and five team. And I went over Thanksgiving break to watch film. I went to the, to the coach's office. I was all excited, popped in the Cal Bears. And, guys, I watched about – one minute of their defense and I turn it off and I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> oh no, this is how it's going to end. These guys are really, really, really good. And they, they kicked our ass from start to finish. And it was, it was a brutal way to end guys because it was the last time I was out there and I didn't get to put the helmet back on and go prove to my teammates that we could play well and kind of get those good feelings back. It was, it was a horrible way to finish. And you, you always hear about, the bad parts of athletics being like ultimately the best teachers. And that was, that was a really difficult one to get over. Uh, but you know, in the end, uh, the fact that I had to get over it was, was probably good, but that was, that was a really rough way to end it. Well, well I, for that reason, I only pulled the, uh, the first half here and we won't, there was, there was a couple hey, of clear yeah. angry faces from, from, from Paul walking off the field in the second half, but we got some take good it to the end, take it to, take it to the end of the first half. And right. it was my only pick six that I threw in, in my career. And it was, I think it was the last play of the first half. Um, Some of the commercials in this, by the way, too, or just there we, go. there we go. So let's take it back to the, back to the start of that play. Should be it. 20 seconds left. So when we get to the start, just as kind of, as I'm under center, hit pause and the two main players in this, or two of the main players in this play were first round draft picks. My left tackle was a guy named Ross Verba, who the Packers took in the first round about three years later when he grew up and he started for them in a Super Bowl or two. But he was about a month away or a month removed from being a 220 pound tight end. And we just put him there because we knew he had potential, but he, was, he struggled there at left tackle. And the guy over him, who pushes him, watch it. He just pushes Ross Verba right back into me. And he was a first round pick named Reagan Upshaw of the Buccaneers. Yeah. And the guy who picked it off and ran it back was the pack. They were the pack 10. Then he was the pack 10 defensive player of the year and eventually got drafted by the chiefs. But 
uh, that was a that was a rough one. Okay, so second and inches. There we go. We pick it up. First down. Feeling good. You know. What's the score? What's the score here? Remember, we can this, stop this. it right here. We can stop it right here. It's a clean completion. First down. <laughs> I think it's sixteen to nothing, maybe. Okay, so still striking distance if you score here. Yeah, and I I check to a deep in over the middle because I think we're in no huddle here. Yeah, I'm calling it a white five U, which means a tight end goes under. Watch the left tackle. Oh my god! And that Reagan upshot has punched me in the face. <laughs> You, like didn't he, get, you didn't get everything on that ball, did you? No, I didn't. It was one of those balls, and Ryan, you played quarterback. You know how yeah. it goes. Like, right in the middle oh, of my it's, release, you know, you, you just get jacked back. It was one of those things. Sheer panic, right? And as soon as that happens, are you just like, please just fall, please just fall somewhere? So you watch me. I get, dri I get hit in the head, boom, I'm dead. Yeah, right there. Oh, there you go. Club. And so I go down, and then I'm just laying on the ground waiting for a cheer, and I hear the cheer. And I look up, I'm like, ah, oh, shit, it's for, their, it's for their guys. It's not for us. <laughs> well, these there days, he goes. These days, Paul, that would have been a flag. Yeah. you Roughing you, the yeah. passer, roughing the pastor, passer, hit to the helmet, first down Buckeyes, or a uh, Hawkeyes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, but, exactly. Man, these, half, these half jerseys here, unbelievable. We're, we're, look at this. Look at this half jersey we got to cut off. <laughs> Yeah, they were the cool guys. <laughs> yeah. The neck, roll, the neck roll and the half jersey is just this early 90s to a T. Yeah. So this is, this is kind of like going to, see, uh, going to see my shrink here, guys. Yeah, we got to get some good stuff. Just, I, got, I, got, I, have some, I have some I have some stuff. We got, we got a little Paul Burmeister speed here. Not much of it. I don't know where you found it. Get the ball here. I think this is the start of the second quarter, maybe. Okay. Ryan Terry. There we go. Dave Sims was the voice of Westwood One NFL football for a while. I didn't know he was on the sideline for us there. Um, let's see. What do we got here? Almost fell down. Keep it. That speed. Look at that down. speed. Down. There we go. <laughs> nice, right? I think this is this is probably early in the game, right? Yeah, I think it's first first quarter still, end of the first, beginning of the second. Let's see what we got here. Give you a little. Long I don't want to throw a bad throw. I don't want to take a sack. I'll tuck the ball under my arm and make a run for it. You can see once he makes up his mind, he goes straight ahead. He doesn't try to juke anybody. He knows doesn't he's not going to run anybody. Love doesn't it. Try to juke anybody? Why not? Look at that headshot! Holy cow! What was I thinking? Brady <laughs> pusher there. Who was I mad at? I appreciate that you didn't slide. You went, you dove. Extra pitch. So, Got to dive. That's right. So I think I'm probably checking to an out route for a soft corner. Boom. There you we go. Get, you get blasted here twice. So you get like bumped. There you go. You get the, get the, what the heck is that? Oh, yeah. I got drilled there. Yo, yeah, the it was like. It was incidental. I think someone like bumped you and then you backed into a guy running full speed who just flattened you from behind. Let's see. Oh, no, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a warranted arm. What's, sure. What's going on here? Somebody owes me five or 15 yards, guys. <laughs> All yeah. right. So this is Rhino formation. Rhino, because the R back is up close. Oh, sprint to him. Ugh. Drop and, pass, yeah. And I, I watched most of this first half, and I, I can only – I mean, you could see the frustration. There was a lot of, like, good passes that were dropped. And I know that's I, – I, I should say I know. Ryan could probably know better than I do. I, that's got to be just the most frustrating feeling when you feel like you're executing and you're just putting the ball where you want to and people aren't handling it or it's slipping out of their hands. I, I can – that's got to be yeah. tough, especially at the end. <laughs> yeah. I think I think what's what's cool is to to have the years go by, guys. And I would have loved to have won that game and have that been the Rose Bowl instead of the Alamo Bowl. But the cool part is you get older and get a family and you know get good at some other things. Is it, it's easy to look back, uh, number one, and say it wasn't as big a deal as I thought it was. And two, it's you, you look back and say, you know what, there were a lot of plays I should have made that I didn't. And you don't have your identity tied up in it anymore. And it's easy to, to say I should have been better here. I wish I would have been better there, but you know just didn't work out that way. And it doesn't have as much to do with how you feel about yourself, obviously. 
as you get older. It's kind of a relieving feeling to shed that over the years. Well, and you brought up, you brought up uh, earlier the Twin Cities. So, so you did continue your football career briefly after, after Iowa here. There so we go. And what, what's, uh, what's going on here? So this is a Monday night game in the preseason. And it was the only game I got into when I was a free agent with the Vikings. And it was, it's funny. I, I got to know Brian Billick very well when I was there. Brian was the quarterback coach before he went on to lead the Ryan's Ravens to the Super Bowl. Also a Ravens fan, yeah. Yeah, way back when. Uh, but it was early in the second half. And they told me before the game, that like, we'd really like to get you in. The Warren, Warren Moon's going to play a little bit. Brad Johnson's going to get a lot of time. But we, we want to see how you're going to do. We want to get you some reps. So Brian Billick walked up to me on the sideline uh, as we were kicking off to – they were the San Diego Chargers. And he's like, we're going to put you in. You're going to go in in a little bit. And as he's saying this to me, there's a big roar from the crowd. And we're both like two yards off the field. And we look up, and Terrell Fletcher, who played at Wisconsin, was returning the kick down the sideline for a touchdown. And so he, like, literally runs right by us, as, as Brian says. We're going to put you in a little bit. Fletcher runs by. We both watch. Brian goes, okay, it's going to be a little bit sooner than we thought. It's going to be in about 30 seconds. So I didn't, I didn't have time to warm up. And I just went in, and this was my first play. This is my first play. It was some kind of handoff. Real quick, why don't these coaches give you more of a heads up? Like, at halftime – well, I think he thought he was. I mean, in a normal, you know, 99% of the time, Terrell Fletcher gets tackled on the 25, and I've got five or six minutes to grab a ball and warm up. I mean – At halftime, he could have been like, hey, first drive of the third quarter is yours. Just start preparing now. I don't think it was the first drive. I think it was like early to mid-third quarter. It wasn't yeah. like just coming out of the halftime locker room. But, okay. Okay. Uh, like, Brian didn't break a stride with the, okay, it's going to be a little sooner than we thought. <laughs> and so that that picture there was was the first play it was a handoff and then I, I threw two incompletions my second one on like third down and eight was literally one of those balls where I needed to put it one one or two feet further out in front of the tight end and a, a weak side linebacker flew out and made a great play and knocked it down and I thought I was going to get back in but the Chargers kept it for like 10 minutes and I forget what happened exactly, but I just – I never got back in. And there's always that thought. Sometimes it keeps me awake. I'm like, what if I would have put that ball one foot ahead of that kid? We get a first down. Maybe we get a drive. Maybe we score. Then I make the team, you one know? Effect. One little change, right? One tiny little change. Yeah. Yeah. So those – I mean, we, we, all live with, we all live with some version of those things, right? And, and so then, so, so, you know, you, you, I guess at some point you realize like, Hey, this probably isn't going to happen at the NFL level or, or you're like, I'm ready to move on from football. Right. Uh, did, is that when you went back to school for a few years? Is that, is that the next move that you made? So I mentioned Brian Billick and the day they cut me, I went back in to get all my stuff and Brian came down to see me and Brian's like, listen, I'm sorry. It didn't work out. I really like you. I want to get you into the World League of American Football. If you guys remember, the World League was playing in Europe then. It was kind of like NFL minor leagues. Yeah, yeah. Before, like, OTAs and mini camps took over the entire spring. And so I said, okay. So I went home and kept in shape. Brian got me drafted by the Amsterdam Admirals. Wait, and, what? Yeah, in, in, the, in the spring or the – I guess it was late winter of 1996, right after I'd been with the Vikings – and I went to training camp, and it was in Suwannee, Georgia, at the, where, where the Falcons used to have their facility down there. And it was me at quarterback and a guy named Will Fuhrer, a left-hander from Virginia Tech, who had actually started some games for the Bears the previous years. But Will was going to be the starter. I was going to be one of the backups. And I was there for about, I'd say, I don't know, a week or 10 days or something. And something just kind of turned off inside of me. Like, I remember so much of what I liked about Iowa is I really liked my teammates. And then I was in the NFL a little bit. I just wanted to be an NFL quarterback. And then I got to NFL Europe and I just felt like a lot of the guys were there because they couldn't do anything else. And I didn't, something about it just wasn't as much fun to me. And I remember going out to the last practice and being like this, after this practice, I'm going to go turn my pads in and go home. Like I've, I've had enough. I'm not good enough to really be a starter anyway. I'm ready to do something else. 
And like, I remember going through practice and throwing a pass and was like, that's the last time I'll do that. We ran sprints. That's the last time I'll do that. And I was the holder and the, the kicker was Adam Vinatieri on that team. <laughs> and so I would go before and after practice and hold for Adam. So practice is over. I take my pads off, spend an extra 15, 20 minutes holding for Adam. And the whole time I'm thinking, this is the last time I'll ever hold for some <laughs> sorry ass kicker who's trying to make it's it. Going and, nowhere. <laughs> And I went in after and gave a couple of high fives, told the coach, I'm like, this, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm ready to move on. I don't want to put, you know, there's no reason for me to be here if I want to be somewhere else. And got on a flight, went home. And so what was the next step? Because obviously football had been your life for your yeah. life. <laughs> yeah. So I started grad school to be an athletic director. That's, that's what I thought I wanted to do. And I ended up getting my master's in that field. But while I was going to school, I got a couple opportunities in local TV to kind of be a part of their football coverage. And the, the, the news director and the sports director at the ABC station really thought I did a nice job. I didn't think I was any good at that point and invited me to kind of learn the entire business, how to work the camera, how to produce the six and 10, how to edit the whole thing together, uh, how to shoot pieces and shoot track meets and wrestling meets. And I was in local TV for six years. Oh, and gosh. oh yes you were and there's video evidence of it right oh here. my gosh look at that <laughs> this is the first oh, stop in, in cedar rapids right that, that's in waterloo oh my god <laughs> where did you find this oh, i told you mitch just finds this stuff live in the second let's half get, let's get a little oh, audio oh, here we'll throw it back yeah. oh tammy weinsack she was what? a good anchor. let's get some audio here okay <laughs> The Indiana fans really gave Luke Rucker a hard time. And it worked in Bloomington. He really got off his game. But today, it just really seemed to light him up in the second half. For the seventh time in a row, the Iowa Hawkeyes won their Big Ten tournament game today. And for the second day in a row, Luke Rucker was the last second hero. Rucker came alive in the second half. After a subpar first half, he scored two <laughs> straight points to give Iowa a one-point lead with 10 minutes and 40 seconds remaining. This putback made it 41-40 black and gold. Rucker and the Hawks then cooled off while the Hoosiers heated up. An 11-2 run gave IU their biggest lead of the game at 51-43. Iowa then waited. No, uh, no major faux pas were found, though. You didn't have, like, a boom, there goes the dynamite moment, which is probably why you're a professional now and, and continue your trend. But You know what I noticed, though, and we think we all probably, you know, more critical of ourselves than we need to be, but, like, did you see how when I was done with the anchor crosstalk, I like immediately just kind of got right into TV mode and I'm announcing and I'm using my TV voice. It was so obvious. I was, I was reading something and as, as one gets better at it, hopefully you cover that up a little more. It's a little more uh, seamless and you're just kind of be a natural, but man, oh man, um, I was, you know, not really that good. Just kind of figuring my way out at that point. Funny. Well, and then and and that experience obviously this was something that became now your your professional career and thinking back on that Alford. Time, what, what's that Steve Steve Alford, Alford. Yeah. I forgot he was the coach of the hot like the hoops coach at, at Iowa yeah yeah for, for quite a while yeah I forgot and that was a hell of a shot by Luke Recker by the way in the Big Ten tournament to win that game but do you look back on this time with, with a fondness or with like, obviously you got to cut your teeth and learn the ropes and probably had a lot of freedom to do so. But what was your, when you think back about this time, what is, what are your thoughts about it? What was the, what were you like, Oh, this is my calling. I found it. Yeah. And I don't know if it, I was ever um, like, I guess took myself seriously enough to say, this is my calling, but I was so excited, Mitch, to have something that I really wanted to try and be good at. And I was, I was, 30, 31, 32 at that point. So the fact that I kind of held on to the football dream till, till I was 25 and it didn't work out and then went through that time of grad school and kind of liking TV a little bit. I was at a point in my late 20s where all my buddies had moved on and they were married and kids and had their career and starting to make that, you know, starting to have that arc and move up. And I, I hadn't really found something I really wanted to be good at until I got this job here. So... Um, in the Midwest, your friends were on their like fifth, sixth kid, right? They were like, they were having teenagers by that point. <laughs> fifth, sixth wife at that point. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, so that, that's like, when I see that, that's what I remember the most is just a really cool feeling of, 
hey, I know I'm not really that great at this yet, but damn it, I, I enjoy this. I really like it. And I know I'm going to do it for a long time. And that was a fun feeling to, to have found something that gave me those, that kind of feeling to want to work at it. Cause I didn't have that um, from the time I left sports as a player till I really got into this business here. And knowing, you know, knowing where your trajectory has been, was there like, and, and how you had it with, okay, NFL is the end all be all, right? Or, or maybe it was Iowa, then, then the NFL. Was there ever a bright shining star when you first got into this industry or as you were working your way through that you're like, I want to be on, were you like, I want to be on network TV? You... Yeah, it's a good question. I wanted to be, I wanted to move up the chart in a bigger market. So if you think about local TV news and you watch the 11 o'clock news, uh, in Eastern Iowa, we were market number 88 out of about 210 or 212 then. So we were pretty small. Yeah, I wanted to move up to Minneapolis. And that's not just because you're wearing the Golden Gopher t-shirt there, Mitch Palooza. I actually wanted that that was my number one goal because I, I was newly married. My wife was in law school in Iowa, and she had an internship up in Minneapolis at a law firm that she really liked. They really liked her, and she got offered a job there. And we wanted to move to Minneapolis. And my goal at that point was to move up to market, you know, 10 or 12 and be the sports anchor at uh, WCCO, the CBS in Minneapolis. And I actually had job interviews there and almost got a job and it didn't work out. And after I got turned down there, I just out of the blue got a job at NFL Network, just completely out of the blue, just kind of happened within a couple of days and we moved to Philadelphia, but I just wanted to be in local TV at a big market in the Midwest. That's it. And then once you made that transition to NFL network, was that, I would imagine that was probably like a, a complete blessing getting to be back in football. Um, and, and was that like, Oh, you're like, I found, I found my home here. Yeah. I felt like I was so lucky. And for as many as the, you know, my football career as a player, I had some real disappointments and we saw them and I kind of felt like I was being paid back a little bit to be able to drive my car up to NFL films and be friends with Steve Sable and Ron Jaworski and Sal Palantonio and have an office there. I literally, my entire time there, and I was, I worked out of the NFL films office, office for three years. Every day I walked in, I'm like, you got to be shitting me. Like, this is my job. I get to do this. So like the, the cool factor of that never, never wore off. And as the network grew up, everything started taking place in LA. So we moved to Los Angeles. But when I was brand new at NFL Network, I, I, felt, like the, I felt like a lottery winner every single damn day. And, and you know, making the transition, at, at any point did it get wrote? Was there a point where you're like, okay, I've done, I, again, like football, I've seen what I need to see in football, or was it just a career opportunity came and you're like, I can, I can go a different way at this point? Um, for, it's like, are you talking about making the transition from local to? As you, as you moved away from the NFL Network and moved over to NBC side. Oh, okay. So yeah, I was at NFL for 10 years and loved it. Uh, but it was somewhat limited in terms of we didn't have live events. Uh, so I really enjoy calling games. I like reporting games in addition to hosting at NFL Network. I mean, it was mostly hosting, which was great. I was lucky to be there. I mean, they could have found a number of guys to do the job I did. But I started to get a taste or a desire to do more things than just host. And I got to know a couple people at NBC. Uh, they offered me a couple of things kind of on the side, and it just took off from there. Um, but it's completely different now. I mean, I go from being a football host to reporting on the sidelines for lacrosse or doing play-by-play -play for the Olympics or hosting the Tour de France. I mean, it was, um, it's the same world, obviously, the, the same job as I had at NFL Network, but man, oh, man, it's a, they are, it's a completely different challenge than what I got used to there. Um, well, let's let's transition here. We've we've gone probably the longest, but you got you got some of the best stories of anyone we've talked to, and, and a wide just like your sports, a wide ar array of experience here. But what was your how, how did the how did the lacrosse thing happen? Obviously, I would imagine NBC approached you, and 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 then you know your first interaction is meeting RJ, which I'd be very I'm very curious to hear that because it's like you go from this old school traditional media of, of you know being on local TV to to the selfie stick interview you know it's it's kind of come full circle here who's the d-bag in the shades and purple shirt first of all <laughs> what, what, the about the one in the, what about the one in the white shirt here acting like you know <laughs> were you guys required to wear sunglasses or was just that sunny 
It's that uh, sunny. It's it was an ING down in Florida. Yeah. It was super. It was super sunny. So um, the yeah, whole people, whole people process, were like, "What are you doing wearing a long? Like, what are you? Why are you wearing this long sleeve? You know, button?" What's up with that, RB? It was like 110 degrees. Like to not get burned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like a you know exactly. He just he just went with the beekeeper suit so to avoid a sunburn. <laughs> He knew he knew he was uh, he was predicting the, the murder hornets coming. <laughs> um, so I, I think you initially brought up Mitch, like how did the lacrosse thing happen for me? And it, it's obvious how it happened for Ryan. He's a Hall of Famer. But um, my my son and we talked about this a little bit earlier. My son's in love with the sport. And I started to see I started to keep track of it a little bit just because of his interest in it. I wanted to be able to have a conversation with him about it. And then I started to see that this guy, Paul Rabel, who my son had tipped me off to like two years before was the best player in the sport. We used to drive down to Long Island to see, to see him play in the MLL. Uh, but I started to see that Paul Rabel was talking about this new, this new professional league that he wanted to start and that they were going to have uh, a great broadcast partner. And I, I got in touch with the VP of NBC sports network, Dan Steer. Um, one of my favorite bosses at NBC. I'm like, Dan, we got to get on this, man. This is a growing sport. It's a popular sport. We should be the ones. Like it should be on NBCSN. Come on. And so you Dan's like, have to lead that charge from within. Well, well, Dan's like, I can't really talk more about it right now. But um, yeah, let's let's have a conversation in a couple of weeks. So I was like, oh, maybe maybe we are the ones. And then I read that NBC was going to be the home of the PLL, and I called him right away. I'm like, Dan, I am in. You know, I'm in, man. I would love to call the games. I would love to host, be a reporter, whatever you need. I'm there to grow with this. And I think Dan appreciated that. It's not like he had 10 different people at NBC calling him up and saying, um, please sign me up. Uh, but just because I wanted a connection with, with my own house here, I was fired up to do it. And then once I got in, the, the humble nature of the guys, they really reminded me of the NHL players. And I host some NHL at NBC, so I've kind of gotten to know that world. There is a, there's a humility and a, and a kind of a, a grit and a willingness to be a normal dude with the media and the NHL that I kind of find with the PLL guys. They were very willing to, to kind of have any kind of interview at any point that I wanted to do. So it was initially a selfish desire to share something with my son, and it turned into I really like and respect these guys, and I want to be a part of it. Awesome. And, and you know – this year, obviously, being what it is, what is your what do you know what your role is going to be with the with the championship tournament that they're doing? Sorry, championship series that they're doing over the over the sixteen days. I don't. Uh, I think I think if you talk to to Ryan and Brendan, Brendan Burke, who was fantastic on the call last year, man, he's 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 really good. If you talk to any of the three of us, we, we would love to go back and have the exact same roles uh, and have it covered the same way. I don't know if those conversations have happened yet. I mean, there's a lot of variables. We'll wait to see at NBC when, when the NHL comes back. Uh, there, there's a lot of things going on. So I would imagine those conversations will happen sometime soon. Uh, but just like Ryan would tell you, I hope I'm there. I hope I'm there for the entire three weeks. And I'm, I'm really excited to play a role, whatever that role is going to be. Ryan told me that you guys are wearing like hamster wheels, that you'd roll in, get the mic on inside the hamster wheel, and then just roll out every day. I don't know. You didn't hear that plan yet? That's just, just early info here. Paul, do you uh, – and obviously you're kind of in the NBC ecosystem, uh, you know, obvious statement there. But do you rem – I remember distinctly the first night we got together at 30 Rock to, to, watch, to watch some college tape because it was so – it was such a jarring thing for me, but, like – that I like was like, is this my life now? Like, like it was one of those. What was like, jarring about it? Like, what was like David Byrne, like talking heads, like, how did we get here? Like, I, cause I, so I'd be curious from your side because Mitch, so we go up in 30 rock to watch a, a, a college game to kind of project that onto like how we're going to call yeah. our games. Yeah. They're like, you did a practice run with the team. Well, it was more of like, we're just going to watch, we're going to watch a game that you called. And, and this was this was me, you, Brendan, our couple main producers, director, and our boss, Dan Steer. Yeah, cop, cop, and Adam Coppinger was there. Yeah. What so, games did you watch? Uh, I forgot what games specifically. It was a college game that I. Game Ryan had recently called. 
But it's the bizarre thing is like they're like, you know, the play by play guys like, oh, so and so like dodges down the alley, and then and then like Dan Dan's like, what? the alley like, what, 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 where, where's he going? You know? And I'm like, oh, it's so like <laughs> no joke. Man. And then someone's like, oh, it's split split dodge, and Dan's like, well, what's a split dodge? And, and and so next thing you know, you're like, actually doing them in the meeting room. Ryan is like actually doing the face dodge and a spin dodge. basically. <laughs> I'm, I'm, up, I'm up doing uh, imaginary split and roll dodges. Sweat. <laughs> and like, I'm like, and, and they're like, go on like a roll dodge. Yes. I'm like, what is going on right now in my life? Like, like, is this normal? Like what? What the hell? What is going on? Like, they were ski jumping. They had a guy in there exploding yeah, off, yeah. right? <laughs> that's, I think that's a, and I never thought about it from your point of view, but like from the NBC, like in the NBC family, you think about how many sports we have that aren't yeah. like household kind of sports for most people. Uh, and so, like, this is how, this is how it starts for a lot of us with whether I'm calling ski jumping or learning lacrosse or calling a track and field meet, whatever. I mean, we've got 100 sports at NBC, and the boss, the director, the producer, the talent will kind of come together and like, let's go. Let's yeah. learn the terms. Let's, let's, let's become experts. Yeah. And that's kind of the culture. Yeah, I, it was just so like, I was just like, is this normal? Like, I don't <laughs> know. And also, like, I'm doing split dodges at 30 Rock uh, against <laughs> a producer. Like... And Mitch, I, like it was like a trilogy coaches session. I'm like up on a whiteboard. Like this is called X. That's this the content that people need to see right there. I yeah. still have my notes. I still have my notes from that. I, I had like eight pages of notes from that day. Hell yeah. Well, well I, I, I so I did the the indoor with Dave Leno, who's a soccer guy, and and he was the play by play guy, and I was the analyst. And same, he, I think the guys that are just real, like you said, Paul, the guys that are professionals, they care about learning. Dave went out and did a ton of research on his own, watched a lot of games, and he would ask me if he had questions. And he's just – he's now he's so good. I mean, he's one of the top play-by-play -play guys in the NLL after one season of never having new lacrosse before because he has eight pages of notes. And he'd be like, right. hey, what's it – he's like, is that a backhand shot or behind the back shot? Yeah. And he wasn't, wasn't afraid to ask those questions. And I think yeah. that you can see it. What did you go home and tell your wife that night, Ryan? <laughs> I don't know if I said something to her or like maybe called like Mitch or another trilogy person. It was like I haven't heard this story. This is gem, this is absolute gem. This is new. Maybe new material. Yeah, I might have told. I might have told my wife. I was also like, we are starting from zero. Like this. <laughs> like I was like, I think I talked to cop Adam that night because I'd worked with him. Mm -hmm. I, I so I think like after dinner, I was like, do you want to go for a walk? Like. And I was like, I was like, oh wow, like there's like, and I call it institutional knowledge. I was like, there is zero institutional knowledge of like X is the area behind the goal, but also where the face-off occurs, which shouldn't be the case. We should probably have different names for that. Yeah. But X and face-off X. So like weird things like that. Um yeah, I I I think I was just like. Like, like I said, like, it was just one of those, like, David Byrne talking heads, like, well, how did, how did we get here? Like, like, <laughs> what, this, this was my life, doing roll dodges at 30 Rock against a producer. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's funny. And it's a, it's a good, uh, curious call by you. Again, I didn't think of it from your point of view, but it must have been very strange to be the only person in there not just an expert, but who kind of knew anything at all. And you're just teaching us as, as newbies yeah. about the ins and outs to make sure to get us started down the right path. Yeah. I, I also remember Ryan too, and this is before I didn't, I hardly knew you at all. I, I knew you were a resource in terms of someone who could teach us all something, but I think it was after week two, and it was at Red Bull maybe. And we went to the truck after the, after the game on NBC. And I don't remember what exactly happened in the game. It was a close game. And you, you did just what an analyst is supposed to do. You made sense of it in the moment right away, had good insight. You explained it well. Just a few times you, in a close game, you nailed it. And I didn't I mean, I knew I liked you. I didn't know you were really good at what you did. And we got into the truck afterward. 
And I stuck my hand out, shook your hand. I said, you're goddamn professional, man. And I think you thought I was messing with you. Well, Cause, no, cause it's, you're yeah. like, oh, now, now you like me. Now you think I'm all right. Known you for like two months. Okay. All right. And I'm like, no, man. I, 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 I throw that out as a compliment. You're a damn professional, man. You know what you're doing. No, it was more of like, a, it was like a Pinocchio, like you're a real boy. It was like, you're a good analyst. And I was like, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I didn't know if you were. <laughs> I knew you were a nice guy. I knew you were a good player. I didn't know that you'd be worth the shit as an analyst. But Mitch, you know, like, you don't talk about, like, the, I think it was just like, you know me well enough, Mitch, to know, like, like I was just like, what, like, what now? Like, what, like, like. I didn't know it was like a backhanded compliment or like kind of a dick. He was like, he, and he was just like, dude, take the compliment. Like, don't like, like, this isn't like not, not time to be competitive. Just take the compliment. And, and then at, I felt bad because I didn't think my response was good. And like you, we ended up kissing and making up, but yeah. No. Oh, you know what it was? I Your think relationship is, you know, you guys are, you know, you guys are having Zoom dates in quarantine. We, we <laughs> think things are okay here. <laughs> No, I think it was because the fact that it wasn't right away. That's what it was. I was like, you waited too long, Paul. You waited too long. You waited too long. Yeah. <laughs> Next Come on, man. <laughs> we, we, you could argue that week two was too early to give you my ultimate compliment and firm handshake. And it wouldn't have mattered, right? Then it wouldn't even it wouldn't have been valid. Yeah. It's true. Premature. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, it's safe to say that that any of that unpolished and uh, and brand newness certainly was not evident to people who watched uh, PLL games. And I was there live for the ones at Red Bull and and watched almost all of them. And you guys did a phenomenal job, and and you know, including Brendan. So hats off that at at no point did I ever know that you were teaching them what a what a face dodge or a dodge was uh, at thirty <laughs> rock only only months before. The whole thing, the whole. I mean, and. I'm just talking about my role and I was of the three that we're talking about. I mean, I'm in third place in terms of what I add and how often I'm in it, but it was a great lesson for me as just like hosting the tour de France or calling ski jumping, like being a sideline reporter for PLL. We have a, we have an expert in the booth. Like I don't need to be an expert. I just need to know enough to recognize when the question should be asked and then ask a basic question to the coach and let him go. So it's a great lesson to me. The PLL was just stay in my little lane pay attention to what's happening in the game and ask a coach a smart question when you get a chance and don't catch yourself out of position. Well, we appreciate you swerving out of your lane to come on, uh, on the trilogy lacrosse theater here. It was, it was, it was really awesome to speak with someone about not lacrosse things, to be honest. Um, so maybe you'll, maybe you'll be our gateway drug to, to other, other celebrities, other stars, other athletes in, in different fields. But um, we always end on kind of a quick hits, and, and I got a couple standard ones and then some new ones since, since you're not a lacrosse guy. But I, I, one of my favorite ones to ask is best place to play. And obviously for you, what was your favorite place to play football? Favorite place to play. Um, so I'll go with place, uh, some place I actually played. I was in a lot of cool stadiums as a backup. But my favorite place that I actually played was Michigan just because of the history there. And it wasn't like going to Ohio State or Wisconsin where you're going to get your head ripped off, you know, verbally every time you step out on the field on the sideline. It was loud and historic, and it meant something to have played there, but it wasn't just a crazy, chaotic scene to make it miserable. So I'll, I'll say Michigan. Awesome. We talked about that long 50-yard walk, right? That's yeah. yeah. Um, best teammate you've ever had? Best teammate I've ever had. I, I, I said his name once today. He was a quarterback – a year ahead of me, Jimmy Hartley, one year older than me. He was the best man at my wedding. Um, he, he taught me how to be a pro when I was in college. He, he came in when he didn't need to, stayed late to study, and knew the offense better than the coaches. And I, I tried to do that just because I saw him do it. And then I talked about the moment where he dislocated his shoulder late in his junior year. He was going to be an All-Big Ten quarterback. He was great. Mm. Uh, and he knew he was never going to play again. He was my biggest supporter when I was playing at the end of his junior year. The happiest guy for me while he was probably on the inside miserable. And, like, I didn't know that quite when I was 21, but I know it damn well now. And so just the whole time I was there with him, he was awesome. Rye, any, Rye, Rye usually goes to the food, the food, and, uh, food and Hidden Gems questions. Favorite dive bar in Iowa City? Favorite dive bar in Iowa City? Hmm. Well, 
I don't want to call a couple of them dive bars because they <laughs> might they might be upset. I distinctly remember in Iowa City going to some underground kind of dive dive bar. The Maybe Dublin Underground. You're leading him. You're leading him right now. It's a lead, you're leading him into, into a into yeah, yeah. It's, it's my favorite Iowa City dive bar. You're the right question, by the way. <laughs> there, there, were two, there were two downstairs underground yeah. places that you would like. The Dublin Underground, okay. awesome place to drink, and the Iowa City Yacht Club, called by the locals, the ICYC. Either, either place. Quality, solid places that knock down some drinks. I think yeah. I've been to the Yacht Club. I'm going to confirm that afterwards. But I think YC, YC might be the best name for an underground bar. <laughs> right? Uh, but my two favorites were the Sports Column and Mickey's. They were right across from each other on the main kind of downtown drag in Iowa City. Football players always went to the Sports Column. But my friends who were in the Greek system went to Mickey's across the street. So I could kind of surf and turf, go back and forth. I could be one of the guys, you know, drink pitchers and then go over with my friends and their girlfriends and kind of do the uh, frat thing as well. So Sen- is senior, good. Year, senior year, Iowa City, after a game, I mean, is it, li- is it like roll out the red carpets, Paul, Paul, and the boys are coming in? Is it yes. exactly what you envisioned? Yeah, it was uh, – th- that part of it is exactly like what you would think in a Big Ten college town in the early 90s when the football team was good. Man, it, was, uh, it was exactly what you think in terms of the scene – and the fun and the kind of things we were doing until two in the morning. So that was, um, that was damn good. Thank God there was no cell phone videos then. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> right? Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're probably thinking the same thing for your days at Cornell and RBs. Like, man, I was, I was a mad dog at Princeton. Good thing nobody was taping me. No, right. No. Mm. <laughs> you know, choir, I was in, I had choir practice after, uh, after the game. <laughs> You had to play chess with your friends. I heard you say that earlier. Yeah, that was a different story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how about uh, favorite sport to call other than football? Ooh, favorite sport to call besides football. I would say the football is my favorite, and I get to do Notre Dame games on the radio every Saturday. That's uh, so much fun. Uh, but favorite sport to call that is not football. I've had an awesome experience calling the Olympics both times just because there's so much history there. And it was such a feeling of triumph to have done two sports that weren't natural to me in water polo and ski jumping like we talked about. That I don't know how well it went. I'm not going to win any awards for it. But to be a part of the Olympics that I grew up watching and to you know, overcome the difficult challenge of directing and calling a sport that wasn't super uh, familiar to me, those were a really fun couple of weeks and fun to look back on too. Well, final question, favorite sports memory of all time, at least for me. Ryan, feel free to interject if you have a few more. No, no, no. We got it. We got it. Man, favorite sports memory. Mitch is just ready to roll this and have his own private Zoom, and you guys can, you know. <laughs> can you uh, We're going to have a breakout room. <laughs> favorite sports memory, I'll, I'll go with two. I talked about one. I mean, going from local TV and small local TV to having an office at NFL Films was like, Every single day felt like, like it was just an awesome thing. And then because, like we've talked about, I didn't play for three, three and a half years at Iowa. There's a lot of time where I thought where I wasn't ever going to be the starting quarterback there. And to have to wait and to have to kind of earn it, it's not so much a game. I remember the Monday after I earned the job, walking into the complex in the meetings and the depth chart having my name first. <laughs> and I was the guy that ran out after the meetings into the – into the huddle with the first team offense and all the guys that I wanted to play with for three years were smiling and hugging me like that. that, that, That's good every time. That's uh, that's an awesome ender and uh, can't say thank you enough for, for coming on agreeing to do this and taking an hour and a half with us on a Friday afternoon. But it was, it was uh, learned a lot about Iowa, learned a lot about water polo and, and, (laughs) It's it's just been awesome to to watch you guys do your thing in lacrosse, and, and it's been it's been cool getting to know you a little bit over the the relation through the relationship with Ryan. So thank you. That was really fun. I appreciate you wanting to do something besides just the um, you know a, a lacrosse Hall of Famer. And I need to thank you because as I said, I was cleaning the house. I was on my hands and knees in the shower, like scrubbing things that I'd never scrubbed before. So you guys threw me a little parachute. So thank you. Anytime. Anytime. Awesome. Well, have a great weekend, Paul. Thank you again. 
Mitch, thank you. RB, I'll talk to you soon. Always.